morning we're going to go in and we're only still in James chapter 1. I don't know if some of you guys feel like we're only in James chapter 1 still. But we're going to finish off the end of James 1 and I'm going to um, just pray and then we're just going to break into it, okay? Okay. God, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for who you are and that's why we come. We're desperate for friendship. We're desperate for fellowship and encouragement. We are. But Lord, we know that it's through your word and through the teaching of your word that we find that undergirding that we're so desperate for. And I pray that you would meet us in a very individual, personal way through your word. And that as you meet us through your word, that you would bring friendship and fellowship and encouragement and comfort in a way that only you can do through your spirit. So Lord, speak to us through your word. We need you. We need to hear from you. I pray you take away distractions and just zero us in, Lord, to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so remember James. It's a book of contrasts. There's lots of contrasting thoughts. Do you remember last month? Again, it's a month ago, so it's like we have to kind of, we've, there's so many things that have happened in our life a month ago. So just for my own clarity, we have to remember last month, in the beginning of James chapter 1, he talked a lot about, or he contrasted these two thoughts. There was this um, mature faith. There's this mature faith that is perfectly mature, complete. The, the, these words are going to be used over and over throughout the Bible when you talk about a, a perfection, a completion, this perfect maturity, this perfect, um, we've completely developed, right? Complete lacking in nothing, right? There's this maturity. And then there's this immaturity. The immature faith. We don't like that one as much. The one that's kind of wavering in their faith, right? Kind of unstable, unbalanced. We don't like to associate with that. We'd much rather associate with the ultra mature, but I think if we're honest, we're somewhere in the middle, right? We're not fully perfected, but we're, we're, we're getting there. And we're, we can kind of resonate with the story of Peter, right? He was stepping out of the boat, man of courage and faith. But the minute he got out of reach of the, his own self-reliance, the boat, that's when he started to sink, right? And that's how we are sometimes. We have all faith. We have all faith. God, do revival at a Halloween trunk or treat. But then when something happens in our life, that's when we're like, wait, what's happening? And we start to kind of question and waver a little bit. And James kind of normalizes that. He's not condoning a wavering, but there's an understanding of there's these two parallel lives that we live that we're aspiring for maturity and faith, and there's that immaturity that, he, that James, through his letter, is going to exhort us as Christians, people who've put their faith in God. Don't just stay in one place. Keep growing. Keep maturing. And what is the tactic that Jesus uses to, to produce maturity in our life? Trials. We all said that with our trials, right? It's a test of our faith. So every person in the world, every person, those with faith, those without faith, they go through hardship. But those of us who've put our faith in God, we also go through trials. So we don't have to be so shocked or surprised. Like, wait a minute, I put my faith in God. What is this? It's part of the process that he uses to develop maturity in our faith. That's how he works. The second contrast that James talks about in the first part of James, that first section that we went over, was this parallel of being rich and being poor, right? He kind of exposed this, this kingdom, this one-day kingdom, this eternal kingdom, and yet we live in this temporal world, right? So he compares like this eternity and this present day. And he says the poor, in other words, those that are poor in spirit, those who acknowledge their need for God, they will be honored. They will be esteemed. It's so different from the, how the world functions here on earth. And that's why he's raising our focus of like, okay, there's an eternal kingdom that those of you who put your faith in God, that are learning to have mature faith, I want you to understand there's this contrast that what the world sees as rich and, and prosperous and, and successful, God says those things are going to fade away. But the things that we put, invest in, as we acknowledge our need for God, as we're poor in spirit and say, God, without you, I'm nothing, those are the people that he esteems, that he honors. He says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so he, Jesus, you remember in Jesus' teaching, he would say, 
Treasure up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither dust or rust will ever come and torment and destroy those things. Because where your heart is, there your treasure will be. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. That's what I meant to say. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And there was that exhortation that we would, we would treasure up for eternal things. And now, now it seems like we're shifting gears, but I think there's a connection. And I'm going to read James chapter 1, verses 13. I'm going to start at verse 12. I know we read um, verse 12 last month, but for, for connection, I'm going to read verses 12, and I'm going to go to vi verse 15. James chapter 1, 12 through 15, and I'm actually going to read it out of the New King James. Okay, now i got to find it. I'm using my phone because I can see better, and the light is brighter, and the words are bigger. So, there. Okay. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Did you notice in the King James, New King James, that in the verse 12 it says, those who endure temptation? Does anyone else have a different translation or a different word? What do you have, Sharon? Trial. So we connected kind of that last verse 12 in our last passage when we were talking about trials, the test of our faith. But in the New King James, it uses the word temptation. And now we're going to talk about temptation. And I think that it's important, I really believe, and for the sake of study and as we're learning, that a trial and a temptation are very different from each other. They're not the same. They're not the same thing. And although the translation and some of them, they use the same word in verse 12, in verse 13 it's a different word. Temptation is not the same thing as a trial. Okay? Both trial and temptation, both of those are tests. Yeah? One is testing your faith. The other is testing your obedience in God. So a trial tests my faith in God. Will I trust him? Will I acknowledge my need for him? And a temptation tests my obedience to him. Will I obey him? Will I do what he asked me to do? So that's where we're going to turn and we're going to see something completely different. This is not a trial. This is a temptation. And it says here, I lost my, my phone. The problem with using a phone is it goes onto my app. Okay, there we go. Let no one say when he's tempted, verse 13, that I'm tempted by God. Another, dis this is a, a very important distinction I want to make clear with, a, with between a trial and a temptation. Both are tests. A trial is used by God. It's used by God to produce maturity, to produce an acknowledgement that I need him. I lack. A trial shows me I lack. Remember it says that I lack for wisdom. I lack you. I lack more of Jesus. I've received Jesus as my Savior, but I, hit a, I go into a storm and I go, Lord, I need you. That's the, that's the purpose of a trial. But a temptation is not from God. It says that when you're tempted, don't think that you're tempted by God. And know that God is not tempted. He is not tempted and he does not tempt. Okay, so it's so crucial that as we're understanding, and maybe this is like foundational, obvious, but I think it's so important as we walk through our life that we see the distinction between a trial, test of our faith, and a temptation, test of our obedience. Okay, a trial is from God. Temptation is from from ourselves. I want to say it's from the devil. I want to say it's from the world. I want to say it's from all the things around me. It's from all these people. It's all these things around me. That's why. That's what the temptation is. Verse 13 says, come in and hello. Your chairs are waiting for you. So happy you're here. It says here, each of us are tempted. 
All of us are tempted. There's not one lady in this room who's like, no, I go through trials. That last month, I, I resonated with that message. That, that message really, like, I could relay the hardship, the trials. Temptation, not so much. None of us can say that, guys. None of us. Isn't that so cool? So any of us who came in full of shame and like, oh my gosh, I'm the only one tempted, guess what? You're not. You're not the only one. As we all go through trials, we're all tempted in different ways. And it says that temptation begins in here, guys. It begins as we're enticed by our own desires. I want to believe that it's all the exterior. It's cable TV, it's internet, it's the hormones and the food, it's my neighbors, it's my family, it's my parents, definitely my parents. It's got to be the air, the circulation in the air. Maybe it's the lighting in here. It has to be something. And there are things that we bring temptation. And we talked about this. You remember we talked about this in the Kingdom Parenting class. And sometimes we can resonate this the most when we're parents and we're like, okay, how do I provide an environment that is without any temptation. So my little angel can be born and grow into a perfect little spotless lamb. How do I do that? How can I provide that perfect environment? And then that little spotless lamb, a month, a year, two years, oh, they're not so spotless. What's wrong with this little lamb? I've kept them pure. Why are they so selfish? Why are they so naughty sometimes? Well, because sin starts inside of us. It does. And a lot of times we want to point the finger at all the things that sin is from and temptation comes from. But so often it comes when we're enticed, it said, by our own desires. I hate that part. I want to blame it on everybody else. It comes from my own desires. My desires for pleasure that war inside of me. The end of James at the end of chapter, in chapter 4, it says, where do these wars and quarrels come? Well, they come from the selfishness that rage inside my body. I fight to gain something because I don't have it. I want to have that. I'm jealous of that. I wish I had more of that. Why don't I have that? Why don't I have that life? It comes from within us, that selfishness. You know that? And the difference with a temptation and a trial is that temptation lures us away from God. It lures us away from Him. As we talked about trials, the intention is that it would draw us close to God, that it would humble us and say, God, I need you. I need you. Without you, I'm nothing. I'm poor. I'm impoverished on my own, but with you, I'm rich. I have everything I need because of you. Temptation has a way of luring us away from God, away from his character, away from his goodness. You remember when Eve was enticed by the devil, by the serpent? He said, did God really say you can't eat from this tree? It looks pretty good. I mean, he's given you this full garden and he, I mean, he's going to hold back this one. Temptation takes us away from seeing who God is and his goodness. It draws us away from him. It makes us feel like we're missing out. Everyone else is having a good time. Why is my life like this? I was thinking about this, and <clears throat> I was remembering when I was in my early 20s. I was a young mom. I was a young wife. And I lived in an Eastern European small town. And there were big, big weather changes. So that meant that there were long stretches of time where I was inside the house. I was born and raised in California. There's not long stretches of time that you have to stay inside your house. So <clears throat> as a young mom and as a young wife, I lived in a different country that I couldn't communicate. And we didn't own a dryer because dryers are not for sale in Hungary at that time. So I had to learn to hang my clothes out on the line. And when it's cold out, they don't dry very well. Anyway, so there would be times when I would have a thought, just a thought, what would my life be? If I woulda, shoulda, coulda. And I would think about things, and I would think about my friends who are my age. They were just finishing college, they were going to parties, they were dating, and I was thinking about them. And then I started to imagine, I wonder what it would have been like if it would have worked out with, with that guy, with my life. And I started to dream about it. And then I started to fantasize about it. And I started to picture this life 
so different than the life I was living. I was like living in California. And there was no weather change. There was no, I had a dryer. I was just living life. And I started to feel like, oh. And then I would like kind of wake up like, what am I doing? My baby needs me. My husband, oh my gosh. And I, I realized I'd been fantasizing about a whole different life. It just started with a thought. Just a thought. It was just like innocent, innocent thought. I wasn't going to do anything, right? And then that thought began like a, a dream and a fantasy that I kind of longed for. And then I couldn't wait to have a minute to go back to that dream and imagine just for a minute. It was just a little escape. It didn't do any harm. I didn't harm anyone, right? It was just inside my own head. No one else had to know about it, but I knew about it. And so then in my life, I was looking at my life and I was looking at my laundry and I was going, why, why do I have to live like this? Why do I live this life? And I was just, just frustrated, discontent. Why do I have to live here? And it just started with a little enticement, just a little thought. And then over time, it grew. And that thought grew and it grew and I had to really stop. And I remember there being a moment, and it was a sobering moment, because I was like, I'm a missionary. I'm a Christian woman. I'm mar- we're, we're serving Jesus. And I was fantasizing about all the lives outside of this world. Do you know how sobering that is? Because I imagined myself as a pretty godly person. On the outside, you could, it looked like that. But inside, I had this whole imagination going on. And that's what sin does, guys. That's how it starts. Just simple, just a thought. It doesn't hurt anyone to think about it, right? And then it breeds, and it, it lures, and entices us. And it stirs up desires that are already inside of us. And then it brings forth, it conceives into sin, and it brings forth death. It's a very um, visual picture when you think of conception, birth. It's like this whole, this whole process of delivery. As women, we can relate to like this whole conception and delivery of sin and death. I mean... It's morbid, but it's descriptive, and that's what temptation does. It starts off so subtle. Trials are meant to draw us close to the Lord, but temptation is calling us away from the Lord. At any moment, at any, any little seed, just enough to keep us away from what God has. Just enough to make us feel like, why, why do I have to live this? If I can only, if only I live this better life. And I had to go through some, there were things that I had to work through in my own relationship with Jesus. Like, Lord, I don't know. I, I don't want to feel this. Please help me. Please forgive me. And it started with repentance. Do you know that temptation, every time it starts with repentance. Like, God, just like we saw with a trial, it was like, God, I need you. I need you. I'm so, with temptation, it's God, forgive me. God, I need you to continue that forgiveness and that work of cleansing in my heart. Do you know, as quick as we do that, we're near to him again. The end of James 4, it will say, resist the devil and he will flee. And draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's a promise. And that's in correlation here with the temptation that we, can, that we need to understand that trials are used to refine us Temptation and sin consumes us. It destroys us. It does. And it might seem small, but it will consume us if we do not acknowledge our need for the Lord. The work of God through his son Jesus is always to restore us. Always. The work of the enemy is always to destroy us. Jesus wants to restore us. The devil has come to still kill and destroy us. He will, and it doesn't take much. He can just plant a seed in my own desires, just in my own feelings, my own thoughts. And yeah, he can use outside forces. There's demon- I believe in the spiritual warfare. I believe in the, the darkness of this world. I do. I do believe that. But I also believe that the darkness in my own heart, that the enemy can just plant a seed, 
And I have an opportunity to choose if I will allow God to bring restoration through forgiveness or will I allow the enemy to bring destruction through sin, through shame. It's a, it's a, it's a tricky one and it gets heavy right out of the gate. When we go into sin and we talk about temptation, I want to shift gears here. He lays it down thick, and then he's going to shift us now into verse 15. I'm going to read this. Sorry, verse 16 to 18. So it tells us that it brings forth death, just destruction. And then he says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Of his creatures. So he shifts gears. He lays this like heavy, heavy burden down and going, the enemy wants to destroy us, guys. It brings forth death. Sin will destroy us. It will. No matter what we think that we have a handle on it, it will bring destruction. We ha it's just crystal clear. There's no real clean contrast. It's just like, I mean, it's as clean as it can be. It's just... You follow the Lord, you follow life, the crown of life, he promises. You follow into the enticement of the devil and the enticement of your own selfish sin, you will lead to death. There's the, there's the, there's the two paths. And then he says, do not be deceived. Not only does the enemy want to destroy us, but he also wants to deceive us. And so he goes right in and says, do not be deceived, my dear brethren. I like, he says brothers, and I know in a lot of different languages, and in Hungarian we had this word too, that it wasn't like necessarily gender. It wasn't like a boy, a brother, or a sister. He would say, my dear siblings. And that's, what, that's how it's worded. It's just my, my siblings here. So we don't have to take offense when he's like, why, didn't he, why do you say brothers? Why do you not say sisters? Well, is it, he's saying siblings. Like we're siblings. Like, you know, like we, had, like we have our aunties and we have our siblings and we have our, you know, like th those are just like those terms that we use. So he, so he goes back and remember... Who's, who's his sibling? Jesus is a sibling, right? So I love it when he calls us his siblings. I don't know, it just means something, like when he says, you're my siblings. Don't be deceived. As temptation brings forth destruction and, and deception, remember, every good and perfect gift. Who is that good and perfect gift? Who is that good and perfect gift? I gave you a hint by saying who? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus is that good and perfect gift that comes down from the Father of light. It's Jesus. He is that good and perfect gift. So as he, as he turns, he's not completely changing the topic. He's saying, this is what temptation does, but remember, remember Jesus. And it's interesting that James doesn't say the name of Jesus very often throughout his letter. You know, you think he'd be name dropping left and right. This is his brother after all. But he doesn't use his name Jesus very often. But here he uses him this good and perfect gift. That's another name for my brother Jesus. That's what he calls him. We're so quick to forget about Jesus, his goodness, his perfection. And I think the enemy loves to deceive us when we start to put this heavy weight upon us that I need to be perfect, I need to do better, I need to do, and then I think, is God really good? Is he really wanting good for me? Maybe there's something better out there, I don't know. And then he reminds us, remember what is truly good, what is altogether perfect? It's Jesus. That's the takeaway. That's what we have to remember. It's Jesus. He is the perfect. He is the good. And I think temptation so often starts to make us kind of blur that line of, is Jesus really good? Is he? Yeah, he's good. And not only is he good, he's perfect. And we can fully trust him and we can fully obey him. This is all in correlation to encouraging us to follow in the test of obedience. Will we obey what God has said through his word, through his son Jesus? It says here, oh, I don't know why this is going off. Okay, here it goes. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. How many of you have these, this verse fully memorized? Love this verse, right? Such a beautiful verse. So good. I love this verse. There is no variation. There's no shadow of turning with God. 
Don't you love that? Don't you love that he's the steady? He's the stable? He's the one who never changes? He never changes, guys. But with that said, the fact that God never changes, that there's never a shifting in him, never. He stays the same. This is still in the back, back as we're talking about temptation. He doesn't change. As a result, we are being changed. As we acknowledge that God never changes, never, but we are in process of being changed. Is that encouraging? For a time, I would read this as kind of a negative, like, oh my gosh, God never changes, but I'm always changing. I'm such a hot mess. I'm always changing. My moods are changing. My ideas are changing. And I would see that as a kind of a criticism. But as I've looked through this with new eyes and I see Jesus as our perfect gift, the perfect and good gift, and then I see that it comes down from God, his Father, the Father of light that never changes, but I am being changed. There's so much hope. Are there things in your life that you think, yeah, this is just the way I am. This is just who it is, how it is. It will never change. This verse, how many times you memorize it, how many times you've quoted it, help us remember that in light that God doesn't change, that we can change. And whoever you're praying for, they can still change, including yourself. You can still change. That's actually the point, that he wants to continue to transform us and change us. Not change your hairdo, not change your style, not change your voice, but change us from the inside. That's what God wants to do. That's, what he, that's his desire. Are there things that maybe you're like, I've learned to be content in this. It's never going to change. This is just how it is. I was thinking of this when I, when on Sunday, we got to dedicate little baby Ruby Joy. And like that little bundles, nothing little about it. She is just the sweetest. It brought so much hope because, you know, when I was dreaming my early days of what my life could be like, how differently my life would be laying out on the beach in California and living that good life. And then on Sunday, I was standing on the platform with all my kids, and I'm not crying. And I was holding my Ruby Joy. And I'll tell you what, I never dreamt, never dreamt that that could happen. Some of you know me, some of you know me when we first moved here. My kids didn't walk with the Lord. None of my kids walked with the Lord when we left hungry. They were navigating, they were young, they were still figuring things out, you know? It was a difficult time in our life, and we knew God had called us out of Hungary, called us to San Diego. We knew that. We knew that it was going to be a tra transition. We knew that. It was going to be difficult. But we didn't know. I didn't know how that would work out in my kids' lives. I didn't. And there were definitely thoughts of, like, did we ruin our kids' life? Raising them in Eastern Europe and then pulling them out in the middle of their life to back to America? Did we totally psychologically damage our children? It, it still crosses my mind. But... I didn't ever dream that this could happen. I prayed for it. I prayed for my kids to love the Lord, but I was okay with like, they could love the Lord maybe somewhere else. And maybe they would find a church that they would go to. And it didn't have to be our church. And maybe there would be people that they could receive from, that they could speak to them about the things of the Lord and they would receive it. And you know what? I was sincerely praying for that. Like whatever you want to do, God, just I want my kids to know you. They don't have to go on the foreign field. They don't have to be full-time staff at a church. I just want them to know Jesus. That's it, honestly. And use whoever and whatever it means that you want to do that. And then I was standing on the platform with my kids who all walk with the Lord. And I didn't, I didn't even expect it. I couldn't even imagine it. And yet God did that work. And guess who was changed? Yeah, God changed my kids. He developed them. I was changed. I didn't stand up on the platform going, yeah, you finally changed my kids. My kids finally got it right. No, I have been changed. Do you understand that the, the promise that God never changes exhorts us, inspires us, encourages us that we are forever being changed, and that's a good thing. Please keep changing me, God. Please keep transforming me, Lord. I'm, my body is changing. My face is changing. But God, would you keep changing me from the inside? Would you keep transforming my insides? 
That's what this verse should, should brighten a light within us. God never stopped changing me. However long you've walked with the Lord, however times you've memorized that verse, help it be such a powerful word of like, God, change me. Keep changing me. You have. You brought me into the light, out of darkness, into light. Thank you so much. Keep changing me. Keep giving me eyes to see. Keep transforming me. We want to ever be changing, ever changing, ever growing, ever developing, ever maturing, ever obeying what God has called us to do. Never stop. Never. Not because I have to, I have to do more, I have to do better. No, God, you're changing me from the inside. From the inside, you've made a difference inside of me. I can't make this change. I can change for a couple days, but I can't sustain a, a lasting change. That has to be a sincere work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's where James keeps breaking this open. He talked about hard days. We all resonated with that. But now when he comes into temptation and sin and change, it's like, oh, this is a little awkward. This is a little personal. But this is where James goes into the heart, the root of the issue, and says, okay, guys, we call ourselves Christians. We know God. We have faith in him. We put our faith in Jesus. Now, will you walk in it? Will you obey it? Will you let, I love how you shared with me that, that it said that, will you let your word affect my attitude, right? That we would allow the truth of what God has said, and now it actually implements into my body, into my life, into my mind. So when I'm enticed, when, I'm, when I desire after the selfish ambition, the jealousy, I long for something more. All of a sudden, the, the word of God, the implanted word of God, and we're going to look at that, begins to shift my mindset. And I have a different mentality now. Phil was talking about that on Sunday, that we talked about that we have this whole different way of seeing trials and suffering. And we have a whole different way of seeing temptation and sin. Not as a legalist, not as, I'm better than that. I can never see myself falling into any of those areas. No, I am capable of any and all sin, all sin. But by God's grace, God, would you keep me? God, would you hold me? Would you change me, my, my mindset, the way that I think, my heart, the way that I process, those thoughts that get just dropped into my head and I start to imagine and fantasize, God, would you help me? Would you help me with that? Would you teach me how to honor you, how to see that your ways are good and you're perfect? Would you help me follow after that? And he says that we are, the, we are his prized possessions. The New Living Translation, it says, in the New King James, it says that we are of his first fruits. We are kind of his, the first fruits of his, creature, of his creatures. This is a picture. We know we talked about through the Old Testament about the first fruits of offering, that we offer our first fruits unto the Lord as a sacrifice, as, a, as an offering to him. And it's a picture, too, of this rebirth this renewing, this new life. We are new creatures in Christ. No longer, our old man has passed away. We have become all new. Jesus would tell Nicodemus in the, in, in the Gospels, when Nicodemus would come to Jesus in the, the nighttime and say, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? I, I know the law. I know all the information. He said, you must be born again. You are first born of water, and then secondly, you must be born of the Spirit. We have enough information, guys. We have information. We need transformation. We have to. If the information of God's truth is not causing transformation in our life, then it's just a lot of information that we know. Nicodemus had a lot of information. He knew so much. He's, he, was a study, he was a Pharisee. He studied the law. And then in the nighttime, he came to Jesus and like, I don't get it. What is this? What do I need to do to be saved? And Jesus would say, you must be born again. I want you to have a rebirth. I want you to be born a whole new person, a whole new mindset, a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way of feeling. This is what it means, guys, to live a new life of Christ in me, living in my life, expressing itself through my life, through the way I speak, through the way I think, through the way I live. Verse 18 here says, excuse me, verse 19, he's going to go in and he's going to talk about in response to this, because of this, because of being new creations, because of who we are, my beloved brethren, my beloved siblings, my siblings, 
Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. This is the response. This is our response. When we see that we are new because of Christ, we have been transformed because of the gospel. This is the word of God, the good and perfect work of God through his son Jesus. Our response, our response to the word, our response to this new life is, I'm going to quickly get up and get a mic up on me and I'm going to tell people where they need to learn, know what to do. That's what I'm going to do. That's my response. When God has changed me, I need to, if someone won't give me a platform, I'm going to find a platform and let people know. No, it does not say that. It doesn't say that. It says that you would be swift to listen. What are we listening to? What are we hearing? What do we need to listen to? Swift to hear? What? Slow to speak. But if I don't speak, who's going to know my testimony? Who's going to know the truth? i got to speak it. If I don't speak it, and then slow to wrath? What? Does this feel off kilter in connection to what we've been talking about? We love that verse. And I think there's a lot of connections to that verse when we talk about our relationships with each other. We talk about our families. We know, yeah, I need to be slow to speak. I need to be quick to listen. But what if we correlate this a little bit more within our identity as new creations in Christ? With the implanted word of God, he's going he's to describe the word of truth. He's going to describe it as the implanted word of God. This perfect, good, perfect gift of Jesus comes into us. He changes us. And I'm just, I just want to hear it. I want to listen. I want to listen, God. I want to hear you, Jesus. I want to hear who you, what, what are you saying? What, what does it mean? Help me to hear you. I'm listening. I'm seeking you, God. I'm trying to hear you. Do we do that? Or we're quick to speak? Speak. What, 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 where is it? Where is it? What do I need to say? What do I need to know? What's the information I need to say and repeat? What do I need to repeat? Give me, the, give me the script and I'll repeat it. I'll recite the words and I'll say it to everyone. Just tell me what to say and I'll say it. We need to receive the word of God and let it go deep. James would say later in chapter 3, let not many of you become teachers because you will receive a stricter judgment because we all stumble in many things, especially in our mouth and our tongue. And we're going to go there. James goes there. It hurts deep when he talks about the tongue and our mouth because we like to talk. I'm a verbal processor myself, guys. I understand we need to verbally process things out. It's just part of the way we are, right? But I think that there's an important thing that a lot of times we see this. We've, we, we're affected by this, and we're also proponents of this. I'm so quick to speak truth, but it's still a process of that truth changing me on the inside. And so I appreciate what you were saying, Patty, of like, there is a place of like speaking truth to myself. There's truth that I need to actually speak to myself. Remember, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of light. Who is that? That's Jesus. God, would you help me? I'm sorry, Lord. I want to resist the devil. I want to resist my temptation. Lord, I want to draw near to you. Would you help me? Would you help me attend my ears to hear from you, Lord? Help me to hear you. Help me to see you that we would learn to be quick to listen and to let God's truth, let God's word absorb into our very beings. Sometimes we're so quick to put on, a, to change comes out from like, well, suddenly I talk very different. I have a whole different vocabulary. I've learned all these new words, so I have to use them. I was always this way in Hungarian. Whenever I learned a new word, I had to use it on a continuum. But I think we do this as Christians. We learn these new words, and so I have to practice them. I want to practice them on all my kids. I would practice all my Bible studies of all my kids. I would like, sit there. I'm going to teach you my Bible study. And we want to learn. We have these new words. We have these new things that we're learning, and we want to, we want to say it. Have you ever been with a friend who, who went through like a great transition of healing through psychology or therapy, and all of a sudden you sit down with them, and they're therapizing you? Have you ever had a friend like that? And they're so excited. They're just so excited how all the breakthroughs that they're learned through therapy and healing and growing, and all of a sudden they're therapizing you. And you're like, I didn't know I called up for a therapy lesson. I'm really happy to hear what has happened for you, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to therapize me. Is that a word? <laughs> no. But we do that, guys. We do that with our relationship with the Lord, don't we? And there's a balance to be said with that. 
as God is changing the things in my life, and he's working in me, and there's grace that I'm learning in a whole new way, I want to say it, I want to share it, I want to communicate, I do. But it's going to come from a place of, of humility and of meekness. And that's why it's really weird when he talks about that we would be slow to wrath. And look what else he says after he talks about being slow to wrath. That the wrath of man, verse 20, does not produce the righteousness of God. 21 says, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Finding it, finding it. What verse am I in? 21? Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. That's the implanted word. What if as we hear as we listen to God's word, as, it, as we allow it to implant deeply root inside our heart and our life, we let it transform us, save us, change us. So the response is not wrath. How dare you do such a thing? That's how I think wrath. That's how I, that's how I imagine wrath to look. But there's a meekness, a humility to what? To sin, to darkness, to filth. Lay aside filthiness, filthiness. What other word is used? Is there another word besides filthiness? A different, this is the New King James. Is there a different word than filthy? I don't use that word filthy very often. Maybe we use it with littles. Is there filthy, filthiness? Okay, filthiness. It's a good one. It's descriptive. Lay aside that. He's not telling you to get up and tell people that they need to lay aside their filthiness. He's telling you and me. What produces righteousness in my life? The implanted word of God. Jesus, in my life, he changes me. And the response to that change is repentance over and over again. God, forgive me, purify me, cleanse my hands and purify my heart. I will mourn, I will grieve, I will turn my laughter into weeping. Forgive me. That's what James will pray at the end of James chapter 4. It's a, it's a prayer of repentance. It's the most beautiful prayer. It's such, a, it's such an empowering word. And sometimes we can feel like, gosh, that seems a little heavy. That seems kind of heavy on a Saturday morning, really. It's like, no, guys. This is starting point. In the most beautiful way of going in a hardship and storms of life are hitting me on every angle. God, I need you. In the same way that as temptation and hardship and darkness is all around me, it's, Lord, I need you. Cleanse me. Purify me again today. And again. And again. Purify me. Cleanse me through your word. We shower daily. We need the word of God to cleanse us daily, moment by moment. We can see the filth. I'm a really good spotter of filth. I can see all the filth. But oftentimes it's the filth that's inside of me that I don't see over time. I get callous of it, you know? Because other people's filth is so much stinkier than mine, right? I hate other people's selfishness. I hate when they're so selfish. But don't talk about my selfishness. That's just my own insecurities. That's not anything big, right? We all have it. And it's the implanted word of God. This is why we do these Bible studies. This is why we read our Bibles. This is why we do homework. This is why, not to prove our worth, not to be better, not to earn each other's respect, but because we need that cleansing work to realign our minds that I need you, Lord. I need your mindset, your perspective, the way that you see things. I need you to show me how to do this because I don't know on my own. And that's that implanted work where it's not just a, a word that I carry around and I hit everybody on the head with it. It's been deeply implanted in my life. And then it's beginning to develop a, a fruit. There's fruit that's coming out, and it's not wrathful. You know those people who know how to recite verses, but it sounds so wrathful. Is that a word? Full of wrath. But what about when we recite the scripture, the truth of God's word, God's truth, and it comes out with mercy? With meekness, with humility, how does that happen? Well, let me keep reading. Let's keep going. I'm going to close here. What verse am I in? Sorry for my eyes. 
21, 22. Thank you so much, friends. You guys are here for me. Lay aside every filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. That was 21. 22 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, he goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. We love these verses. Familiar, kind of, for some of us. We know these verses. We love these verses. They're really powerful. They're challenging, but they're really like powerful verses. We love those. So this picture... As we receive the implanted word, it's already in us, the work of Jesus, salvation, the cross. We receive this. We love this for new believers. God, I thank you for forgiving me. Come into my life. Redeem my life. Forgive me. And I want to I live now my life in you. And now that word has been implanted in my heart. It's, I am now a new creation in Christ. And it says, now, now do. Now respond. Repent continuously. And also obey. Respond to it. Do what it says. Do what the word of God is asking. So is this like giving me a list of like, okay, so what do I need to do? How do I need to do this? What do I need to do? Well, the picture that it puts is like, it's like a person looking at themselves in a mirror. And the mirror is the perfect law of liberty. What is the perfect law of liberty? Who is the perfect law of liberty? Had to give you a little help. Okay, so I look into the mirror and I see Jesus. I see him. So often when I read my Bible and we have a study like this and we're reminded of grace and what Jesus has done for me, it makes me feel so warm inside and so encouraged. And when Phil will exhort us through the word and there's this message of grace and the work of the gospel, it's like, oh, yes. But how quickly when we leave... We forget. We forget about the work of Jesus. And we feel like, I'm so ashamed. I should do better. I should be better. Or we forget and we say, you should be ashamed. You should do better. You should be better. If we find ourselves on either of these extremes, we've forgotten Jesus. When I see myself in the reflection of who Jesus is, that he has forgiven me of all of my sins because of the cross. And he is changing me, changing me, transforming me. Not anything that I can do in and of myself. He does that work. That's what the implanted word says, guys. That's what God's truth says. That's what the gospel is. It's the work of God, Jesus, his power. So that's what I see in the mirror. Wow, gosh, I'm a beautiful person because of Jesus. I'm fully redeemed. I am perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. That's what the word says. It is. But if I go away from that mirror and I'm like, girls, you guys, I am perfect. I am complete and I am lacking in nothing. What would you feel about that? How would you feel about that? When we understand the rightly dividing of God's truth through the work of the gospel, there is no room for self-gratification. There's a healthy, spirit-filled self-awareness, if I can use that word, that as I'm daily in his word, if I'm, as I'm constantly allowing him to examine my heart through repentance and through the study of his word, there's a healthy place that he brings me in. I'm, I'm, I'm still aspiring to get there. I'm asking God to bring healing and to do that work so that when I walk away from his word and I go out into the world that I can see people not below me, but through the eyes of Jesus. Phil talked about this picture of like, I forget how he worded it in 1 Peter. He was saying, you know, so often we see ourselves as Christians as we're like kind of an upper class of humanity, kind of 2.0 humans. You know, now I've received Christ, so now I have kind of like a higher level of status. 
right? And sometimes we can feel that way. And there is a level of confidence that I feel because of the righteousness of God. I feel so grateful. I feel so full of gratitude for what God has done that it does make me kind of lift me above. Like, God, I am saved. I'm no longer bound to my sin. I am, I'm going to heaven. But if that produces an air about me that looks down upon the lowly, like, oh, you, yeah, one day you'll get there. That's not the work of God. It's not. Or if it produces this air of like, oh, I'm just, I'm just trying to get there. I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to do more. I'm doing my best. I just, I'm just not quite cutting it. Get back to the mirror and see the truth. See who Jesus is. See who you are because of what God has done. It is Christ in us. It is Christ changing us, and it is Christ developing in us the fruits of his spirit. It's not our own efforts. And we need to ask the Lord to help. Lord, I don't want to perpetuate that, and I don't want to be a part of that. I want to be a person who is just receiving the truth of your, of your word, being changed, being transformed, and I want to go out and I want to see things the way that you see. And I want people to see me, and I want them to see you. I think the most hurtful thing so often are people who misrepresent Christ. They call themselves Christians. They call themselves leaders. And then they're like, paint this really ugly picture. And we're like, oh, I'm not that kind of Christian. Don't associate that with us. We don't go to that kind of Christianity. And that's that person of like, they, 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 they know all these things. They know all these truths. And yet they, they walk away and they misrepresent. Jesus would say, Right before he tells the parable, we talked about this, the last few studies about the parable of the foolish man and the wise man, right? The one who built his house upon the rock and the one who built his house upon the sand. Right before he taught that parable, he says, there will be many people in the last days who will say, Lord, Lord, don't you know me? Remember me? I taught these great messages. I led a women's Bible study. Oh, yeah. I prophesied, I did miracles in your name. And he would say, I don't, I, I'm sorry, I don't know you. What? How is that even possible? If they look like a duck and quack like a duck, they've got to be a duck, right? No, they are not. And that's what James is breaking open. You might wear all the clothes, you might have all the costumes, you might have all the words, but if it's not inside, if it hasn't permeated your insides, it's not, it's not the same. Jesus says, if you don't obey what I've asked you to do and live out the gospel, live out the truth of what Jesus has done, I don't know you. I don't know you. I know those who acknowledge their need for me, acknowledge their need for repentance, acknowledge just a constant renewal of God, I need you. God, I need you. Draw near to God. God, draw near to him. And I want to close on this one last thought. When, when, the, when James will say, I was talking to a friend this last week, and she really likes that verse, draw near to God and God will draw near to you, but she also really kind of hurts her feelings. Because she said, Joy, does that mean if I'm not drawing near to God, is God not drawing near to me? Like, is he turning his back on me? Because we're so kind of black and white, aren't we? Because we picture this like, I'm drawing near to you, God. I'm at women's Bible study. I'm worshiping. I'm praying. I'm reading. Draw near to me, God. I'm here. And somehow we're like feeling like we're convincing him to draw near to us. That's not the picture. That's not the picture. Remember what we learned? God never changes. There's no shifting shadow. He never moved. He never turns around. He never turns his back. We do. We step away because of sin, because of enticements, just things that lure me away, just my own dreams and fantasies. And then there's sin that kind of separate me away from God. And I feel distant from God. And then I feel guilty because I feel distant from God. So then I might as well just do it because I'm already away from God. So I might as well just give into it anyway, right? And that's how we kind of convince ourselves on this. But I want to remind us that this, this invitation of drawing near to God, he never moves, he never leaves, he never turns, he's never given a cold shoulder, he's never kind of arms folded, like I'm waiting for you to draw near, I'm just here waiting. No, as we repent, Proverbs would say that the righteous man falls down, how many times? 
seven times or something like that, and he gets back up. As we fall and as we acknowledge our sin and as we repent of God, God, forgive me, forgive me, remind me of where I've come, bring me back to that place of, with you, that he's right there. And it's just that embrace, we're, we're connected again, just like that. We don't have to gravel and crawl and work penance to make our way back to him. It's in the word of repentance that we say, God, would you cleanse me? Would you purify my heart? Would you cleanse my hands? Would you bring me back to you? And in that moment, we're restored. That's the work of Jesus. He's here to restore us. And I want to give a chance, as you're thinking of this, we're going to pray and I'm going to close off. Maybe there's some of you who can think back and you can think of things of, I don't think God can ever change this. No, I've been praying a long time. I've kind of just, I'm just okay with it now. And maybe you, there's an opportunity that we could like open that up again. And just for prayer, just for, not for advice or guidance necessarily, but just for prayer. What are things that you're asking God? Would you bring change? Would you change it in me? Would you change these things, God? You never change, but would you change me? Thank you so much for joining us, whether online or in person. We pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is encouraging you in your faith. If you would like to follow along with what we are doing or hear more teachings, you can do so by downloading the Calvary SD mobile or TV app. Also, if you would like to partner with us and worship through giving, you can do so at calvarysd.com give. Thanks for tuning in.